Hi, I'm going to re read you a uh, chapter from my novel, Imagine. Um, you can get it on Amazon, by the way. The bike felt good and strong beneath Suske as he pushed its power along the quieter stretches of straight roads south of the city. He immediately noticed the trickle of people travelling in the opposite direction. <clears throat> he was taking and carrying what seemed to be their whole world upon their shoulders. He saw a family or two and they all looked tired but were smiling broadly. Heading further south and intending to visit some friends in Lebanon, he began to see more and more people heading back along the stretches he passed through. They were coming back toward where they knew their home to be. Strangely, they also carried somewhere upon them, in a shirt pocket, a tiny hand, sticking out from their large burdens, a single white flower. Every single person carried this instrument from nature to announce their peaceful arrival home. As Suski made his way, the road filled with the joyful hum of more and more people coming from the north and east. There were few heading in his direction, and yet he still felt called to his new home. It gave his heart great pleasure <clears throat> to see his people returning. And the slow progress was still very much a procession of joy. At one point, the whole road was so choked with people that the potent fragrance of the small flowers dominated the senses. The happy faces, the order in the disorder of such a crowd with single peaceful purpose, the smell of the lilies, were images and sensations he would never forget. And then she was there, a beautiful little girl who was wearing a red skirt that was way too big for her and dragging along on the ground behind her. They caught each other's gaze. As he slowly rode through the crowd, she made her way over to him. She held up her white flower for him and gave it to him with such a beautiful smile that he would never forget. He touched her gently on her forehead and then she was gone back to her family and her trek home. Suski, riding now without a helmet, headed steadily for the south and west. Already farmlands were being worked again and piles of debris were appearing. Construction teams, engineers and architects were mobilising in every town and village he passed. Men and women in earnest discussion, hard hats and colourful vests with notebooks and laptops in hand. It was a hive of hopeful activity and he felt great excitement as he left village after village for the open road and a countryside being restored by the hour. There was still much tumult, but it was clear that order and reconstruction were both being rapidly and actively pursued. In every location, the overwhelming sense was one of hope and joy. He was greeted with smiles and conversation everywhere he paused. There was a feeling that all were part of a great step into a brave new world of practicality, cooperation and peace. It was so different to the atmosphere in his country just a week ago, then Destruction, suspicion, fear and violence reigned. It was remarkable what a new week had brought to his beloved home. He had a simple tent and it was easy to find a quiet, soft field of grass amidst a shady copse of cedar trees at the northern edge of Rabelais. He found some dry twigs and some larger bits of wood and lit a fire. The scent of the cedar as it popped and burned was intoxicating. It gave a fierce heat as he lay back and looked up at the myriad stars above. Suski climbed into his tent to sleep and dreamt. In his dreams, Suski found himself looking out from a high cliff top across a seaside village and people relaxing and playing on a fine beach. The clouds drifting past the headland onto the far horizon, the sea an emerald blue. He awoke to the usual calls to prayer 
and crawled out from his tent to greet the morning and the town from his campsite on the highest hill to the north of the town. He then realised the familiar verses and calls were odd in this town of crosses and churches. When he listened more carefully, it wasn't the usual Adhan and wasn't a Christian greeting. The call was an ancient Arabic text that he had not heard since he was a little boy. It was a poem and it was being sung in a round in perfect harmony from each of the eight major churches and mosques of the village. The song built and echoed around the pretty valley he was looking upon. He puzzled how such a calming yet inspiring music could be welcoming, welcoming him to his new life and the adventure to come. As he looked about the town where the dawn was becoming morning, he noticed one more thing. None of the churches any longer bore crosses and none of the mosques bore crescents atop their minarets. Susky had never seen a town like this and he had visited Rableh many times before. The valley stood as one with such music to calm every heart, every soul. He pulled out his phone and was surprised to see 30% battery charge still there. He was also surprised to see such a strong signal without any obvious telecommunications towers that could be seen. He was hoping she would answer. She picked up. He would see her today. Suski packed up his few belongings and his tent skirted the town as the harmonies burnt into each other and finally faded with the softest of peals of the bells of the town. He found his way back onto the potholed and shelled highway and within 10 minutes he was across the border at which he was greeted by not a soul and he was into Lebanon. As he slowed and paused to take in the numerous memories that he had from his times in the country, he noted the abandoned refugee camp to his left. A sea of tents without a single occupant. The cool morning breeze felt good against his bare face and he let the bike have its way. To the sounds of Led Zeppelin blaring, the abandoned border simply reinforced his sense of purpose and freedom. They had agreed to meet in Baalbek. Zoe, the Christian girl that he had fallen for all those years ago. She who had ridden upon his conscience and who, had, and who he had never forgotten in all the time he had been radicalised. The woman who had first shown him what true tenderness and compassion looked like within the intricacy of two people getting to know each other so overwhelmingly in such a short space of time. The person he could never abandon in his heart even though she could not journey with him before. He asked himself, could it be different this time? His heart swelled with hope as he dodged the worst of the crevices and obstacles on the road. 10 years before they had spent a day at the vast Roman ruins, marveling at the reach and the sheer physical presence of that great civilization at Baalbek. The columns seemingly reaching up to the sky imposing their stature on all that might view them. Originally, Baalbek was a site developed by the Greeks. Under the Romans, who built a temple here to Jupiter, it came to represent how magnificent Rome could be away from the swampy edge of the Tiber itself. Some of the stones here weighed over 3,000 tonnes and were over 60 feet in length. To see them was to be able to shut out any extraneous thoughts as the magnitude of the buildings themselves and their construction consumed you. Susky parked his bike at the base of a steep rise of ancient stone steps. He knew that there was something atop them that would be able to override the mesmerizing effect that the place itself engendered within him. There she was standing, facing away from him, her long straight hair shifting gently in the soft breeze, wearing a flowery summer dress that almost showed her knees. Simple flat shoes. She turned to him on that ancient temple forum 
and her smile consumed him. A smile that included her big brown eyes that lit up the space between them. A smile that it, uh, they quietly came together, hugged each other with all their being, finally releasing to find a place to be together, to talk, to understand. Their hands naturally came together and they wandered about the complex and found a shady spot produced by a column that had been erected some 18 centuries before. Sitting on a pedestal, they sat side by side, knees touching and gazes exploring. They spoke quietly and animatedly. They knew they were home together. Their voices touching ancient sentiments between them, their hands exploring the touch that they had begun to explore when they had first met. His hand was drawn to her hair and he stroked her neck and back as finally their physical meeting could pull together all the emotions and desires that they felt. She melted under his touch and it was as if the years had never come between them. They were drawn to each other like the moon to the earth. She was the brightest light in his universe, and he was her poet and muse in one. Their kiss was inevitable. It was soft, exploratory, dazzling, delicious. It was to seal their love that now made so much sense where once it had confused and divided them. Now it was clear that their love really did conquer all other factors. Time and space had been drawn in their favour once again after all these years. In this ancient place, they reignited their commitment to love each other. There were no more places to hide or cultural nuances to be defied. Now it was just them, Susky and Zoe, and their love. I'm going to stop there. It's not quite the chapter. There's quite a bit more to that chapter, but um, I think I'll read a bit more on another time. Hope you enjoy. Imagine a novel, Richard A. Harris. You can get it on Amazon. Cheers.